I'll have my back to Pat, but that's okay. So I am Christina Bogger. I'm a, an aquatic invasive species biologist with the Michigan DNR. I have a joint position between the fisheries division and the parks and recreation division. So I talk to lake associations all the time. I'm really happy to be here to talk about how we can all work together on AIS prevention. Um, I'm also happy to introduce Pat Whalen. He is the district supervisor for the Plainwell district in the Parks and Rec Division. So he's like the top guy um, here in your area. And he'll have answers to every question that you could possibly put, right? I'm not overselling sure, that yeah. at all. Um, so let's get started. DNR works and partners with lots of organizations on lots of different initiatives around the state. Um, so we will focus strictly on the boat wash or boat cleaning station um, partnerships that we have going on now. Um, but if you have any question, questions about anything else, I'm happy to entertain those. No? There we go. All right. So I always like to start with the definition of invasive species because folks tend to have different perceptions of what we mean sometimes when we say that. So the state definition follows the federal guidelines for what an invasive species is. So here in Michigan, it would be one, it would be a species that's not native to our state and it has to cause some kind of harm. And that harm would be to the environment, to the economy or to human health. Um, and so a lot of you probably deal with uh, what we would call nuisance aquatic plants. So those would, potentially be native plants that <clears throat> grow and bloom and become bothersome to you on your lakes. Those would technically not be classified as an invasive species because those are native. So I just wanna make sure that we're all clear on what I mean when I say invasive. Um, and the interesting thing about invasive species is that they don't obey property lines, boundary lines, right? And so, uh, they will spread from neighbor to neighbor, from state to state, from country to country. And there's typically very little that holds them back uh, from being successful in their new area. But because they don't obey these fake boundary lines, so to speak, uh, you really need a cooperative and a collaborative approach to their management because they impact more than just one person, more than just one entity. Um, and feel free to ask me questions throughout. We don't have to hold questions till the end, just FYI. Do you now, have a clicker? Is that a oh, do you, you have a yeah. clicker? Oh, thanks, Alex. <laughs> you just Who invited this guy? Right? I invited myself. I, I know you did. Really that's did. why I said that. <laughs> <laughs> we will not forget to do that in the future. That's <laughs> All right. Oh, so much nicer. Thank you. <laughs> I'm like uh, a chair. Oh, oh no, that's sense. okay. Now at least, uh, can you all see me or are you, are you see the screen? Okay. Uh, all right, where was I? So to hit in on that boundary line issue with invasives, a lot of times people think that it's just like a Michigan issue or an American issue, and it's really not. This is a worldwide problem. And so there are species here in Michigan and the United States that we just take for granted, and we don't think twice about. But those have been introduced to other countries around the world, and they are causing the same kind of problems over there that we're dealing with over here from their species. And so this is just a really short list. I can make this list a lot longer if I wanted to, but things like um, rainbow trout. It's a very popular fish species. Uh, common raccoon. We all have raccoons in our neighborhoods, right? Like, we don't think twice about it. But over in Ireland, in Europe, those things cause a lot of problems. Mm. And so this complicates the issue because it is truly a worldwide issue. It's not something that's always happening at a local scale. And what also complicates the issue is that Michigan has a tremendous amount of natural resources to it. So we have about 20 million acres of forests. We have, uh, over 10,000 inland lakes. We have 5 million acres of wetlands. And so we don't live in a desert, right? If a species is introduced into our state, there's a good probability that there's a habitat for it 
here where we live. Um, croplands, the very last picture is of a soybean field, right? And so there are a lot of agricultural pests that can be introduced here also because we are a big egg community. You cannot drive down any highway in the state without eventually running into a farm. So just things to consider is that um, when it comes to the invasive species world, there's a lot going on. And I love this invasion curve. This was um, made by Tom Alwyn in Eagle. And I think it easily explains um, some of the basic concepts of invasive species biology. So here on this graph, if you look on the left is the abundance line going up and down. Um, on the right is the cost, so the cost of management. And then time is that x-axis going across the bottom. So what we see when it comes to invasive species is this S line, right? And so if the abundance of a, of a species is low, the cost to manage it is low, and it probably hasn't been around for that long. Whereas if you look at the very end of that line, the abundance is high, the cost to manage is high, and it's likely been here for a little while. But I'm gonna walk you through this curve uh, a little bit more than that. And so prevention is always the cheapest and the easiest way to manage invasives, right? You don't have it, it's very minimal cost compared to if you do. But let's say something gets introduced. And so in this scenario, it's introduced in Detroit, which makes sense because it's a very populated area. There's ports, there's a lot of shipping in that area. Uh, this is actually what happened with emerald ash borer. So this could be a real life scenario if you want to think about it like that. So something gets introduced into that town. Now, if we don't find it right away, or if um, potentially there are no best management practices to go after it, it's going to start to spread. And so this is where we still have hope of eradication because it's only in a couple of different areas, um, but we have to find it first, right? That's the key. We have to know that it's there because if we don't catch on to it or detect it by any means, it's going to continue to spread. And we get to this point where it's going to be statewide. And this map could easily be Phragmites. Do all of you know what Phragmites are? Yeah, they're a giant reed plant. They grow 20 feet in the air. They become a bird hazard in the winter. Um, they mess with a water quality and the ecology of the area. They're a really nasty plants to have around. And so then we're just looking at, all right, where can we control this? And where are our highest priority places? Because if we still can't stop it at that point, we are then only able to control it in priority places because it will be everywhere at that point. So again, think of that emerald ash borer example. Like we didn't have a lot of options when it was first introduced into the state to control it. How many of you have an ash tree anymore on your property? Right? You do. Yes, I do. You should submit it for testing because that is a very special genetic yes, tree. Um, so bottom line here with my little summary here is that prevention is always best. So how do invasive species spread? There's lots of ways that they can move around. So wildlife can move them. Um, there are scientific uh, papers out there about how waterfowl can move aquatic plants around as they go from lake to lake. Uh, they're shipping. Uh, shipping is a major industry here in the States. When it comes to ballast water or wood shipping containers, a lot of things get introduced that way. There are storms. So we just had Hurricane Ian uh, hit the US. Storms like hurricanes and tornadoes have been proven to move invasives from one uh, place to another. Fish have been reintroduced into new lakes they've never been in before. And I always think, Man, what was going through that fish's head as it's like flying through the air, right? Like unbelievable. But those are cases where they can move. But by and large, people are moving them um, because we enjoy being outside, right? And anytime you step foot outside, there's the chance that you could be taking an invasive with you. So boaters and anglers are probably a big concern for this group um, with their watercraft and their gear but also campers, so campers move firewood. Our forest pests are being transferred around the state right now through firewood. 
um, and it's causing major issues around the state. Hunters and trail users can definitely spread um, invasives by using um, ATVs and equipment like that. If they're not cleaning their gear, they could be spreading seeds from invasive plants around. And then gardeners and pond owners are also a target group of us at the state because some invasive species are still legally sold uh, in stores. We do not have a statute on making them illegal to sell. And when some pond owners get have an overabundance of a specific plant on their property, they oftentimes will take it to a nearby water body and just dump it. And if that's an invasive species, that's a way for them to spread also. So there are a lot of actors. Yes, Craig. Can we say with certainty that our, uh, at least for aquatic invasive species, that our public access site is the single largest spreader? Or would you augment or disagree with that statement? I don't know that there's been a study done to show that. I think ballast water would be up there also. Um, it's definitely up there. Like if, if you're asking me to rank like what all these pathways are, the boating pathway is probably one in the top three. Okay. I mean, often what I hear sometimes is like, oh, well, this can spread by birds and stuff too. So, you know, don't blame the, you know, boaters that are visiting your lake so much. What I will say that this, so the boating pathway, which I'll get to you next. Okay. <laughs> What I will say in response to that is that, yes, the boating pathway is huge um, for moving invasive species around, but it's not always visitors to the lake. And so I would make the argument that the landowners around that water body also have a responsibility. And my example here would be zebra mussels. So zebra mussels, you have all likely heard of, right? They uh, can totally change a water body. The first inland lakes in Michigan that were infested with zebra mussels were private water bodies with no public access. And that was because boaters, anglers were going out to Lake Erie and fishing, bringing their boat back to their home, home lake and not cleaning it properly. And they're the ones that introduced it to their own lake. And so everybody, I make the argument, everybody has a responsibility to take the steps. It's not just people who are visiting a lake that don't live on. Yeah. So the boating pathway is huge, right? Um, so the DNR administers about, you know, I should, we don't even, we don't have the final number. It's somewhere around 1,300 uh, boating access sites around the state. So keep in mind that I said we have over 10,000 lakes in the state of Michigan. So the DNR provides access to about 10% of them, which in the grand scheme of things is, is a lower number, right? We're not providing access everywhere. Um, but regardless, the public have a right to use the public water bodies of the state of Michigan. And that is one of the goals of the DNR is to provide access to all citizens of the state to its natural resources. And this is why we have state parks and rec areas. This is why we have state forest land. This is why we have wildlife game areas. And so boating access sites gets kind of lumped into that category of providing access. Um, the problem here is when you have people who don't clean their boats after they leave a lake. And so case in point, this picture on the right, weeds are wrapped around that motor. Um, and so if that boater did not clean, I would hope, especially with the amount of weeds on that, on that motor, I would hope they would clean it off. But if that boater did not efficiently clean off their motor and they went, took that boat to another lake, that's a way to introduce invasive plants to a new water body. So <clears throat> keeping in mind that prevention is always the easiest and the cheapest, what is the DNR doing, right? So we have 1300 access sites, which is a large number in general. Um, we cannot have a boat wash station at every single access site. That's just not feasible. So how have we approached this problem? Well, first of all, we have signage. So, the DNR works in collaboration with EGLE and the Michigan Department of Ag and Rural Development on our invasive species program. And so we have signs at every single access site in the state of Michigan that the DNR administers that outlines and reminds people to clean, drain, dry, and outlines the loss. Is yes. there any data at all that indicates signs even work? Yes. 
Yeah, elaborate, please. I don't have it in front of me, but yeah, there's been there's been several studies, a couple out of Wisconsin. Um, any from it. Michigan? Uh, I don't know of any that are published from Michigan. No, um, we, we have an ongoing study with MSU that is looking at um, a voter outreach in general uh, in relation to aquatic invasive species, and the signs are a piece of that. And it's uh, it's doing some face to face surveys with anglers and boaters. Um, some watching at access sites, but uh, that, that study is, is ongoing at this time. It hasn't been published. I don't know the outcome of it yet either. But. So eventually we'll have something, um, but there is some stuff from Wisconsin that shows um, signage is one tool that gets you one step closer to changing behaviors, but not a silver bullet, no. Yeah, so it's one part of a plan, right? Um, so... Like for instance, Kevin was the lead for a billboard campaign. Did anybody drive down any highways in the last couple of years and see a stock aquatic hitchhikers billboard? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. I'm really enjoying all of your answers today. Um, <laughs> um, and so, you know, the more you hit people with a message, the more likely they are to eventually absorb it. Um, another key part is to make sure that people are actually doing it at a boating access site that they are cleaning. Peer pressure is another study that's been shown to work. Um, mm -hmm. If somebody has stopped and is cleaning their boat from weeds, someone else is more likely to also stop and do it. Um, it's crazy that adults, we still succumb to peer pressure and social expectations when it comes to some of these things. So we do have signage at all of our sites. If you know of a site that does not have this little sign, let me know, um, because they do get vandalized, they get stolen, they get uh, destroyed. People use them as shooting practices. Uh, it's really unfortunate, but if you're aware of a site that doesn't have that teal sign, let me know and we can fix that situation. Uh, we also started a stenciling campaign. So for boating access sites that have pavement, right? So they can't be gravel or dirt that have pavement, we have reminders on the inbound and outbound lanes reminding people to clean drain drive. And hopefully they know what that message is and what that means, right? That we've hit them enough with um, information at that point that they're aware of what, what we're asking them to do. So we do have stenciling at sites also around the state. And then we partner with folks on boat wash and boat, boat cleaning stations. So that's now we're gonna get into the, the fun part of my talk. Um, so in my world uh, with Parks and Rec Division, I always think that we have three options. Um, and so the first option would be a permanent boat wash station. So there are a few of these around the state. These are permanent stations that do not go away in the winter. You winterize them. They have electrical and water supplies. They have a wastewater system. Um, they're a high pressure wash. So, so people can go up, grab their wand, and literally wash their boat. Um, there are options to either have that be hot water or cold water, depending on the amount of money people want to spend and, and um, how important that hot water is to them. Um, these tend to be expensive. I always give the range of like 50000 to 150000 to install a permanent boat wash station. Those numbers are probably old. Uh, I would not be surprised, Kevin, maybe you have updated numbers. Yeah, with inflation, yeah, with inflation and the cost of everything going up, I wouldn't be surprised if that was pushing several hundred thousand dollars now to install a permanent station. So these are more rare because they are more expensive. You have permitting considerations. Um, they're a big deal. There are mobile boat wash stations. I'll just quickly say that for the park side of things, we don't recommend that people have a mobile unit just parked at a boating access site, unless if it's staffed. We don't want people who generally don't know what they're doing um, to mess around with a, boat, a mobile station. And then we have what are called CD3 stations. So CD3 stands for clean, drain, dry, and dispose. Um, and there are, I think, four basic units within these. Um, so you have the wayside unit, which is the one that's in the middle. Um, that has everything you could want. These are waterless cleaning stations. So they don't, unlike a boat wash, there is no like wand or hose here. 
but they have air compressors so that you can blow your boat off from anything that might have gathered onto it. They have vacuums so you can suck water and things out of your live wells. They have um, pulleys, they have plug, plug wrenches so you can un, uh, pull the plug and drain all the water out of your boat. The neat thing about these machines is it's all in one spot. So you can have like a special turnout lane just to use these. Um, they're very simple to use, right? Most of these tools are very simple. People don't question how to use them too much. Um, you don't need electrical or water supplies, so that makes them a little more easier to install um, because they do have solar options. So if you don't have electricity at that access site, you can buy a solar unit. Um, they have a mobile CD3 station, which again, um, for this case, I would say that we would probably consider a mobile CD3 station because it, unlike a boat wash, it, it's essentially a wayside unit, but on wheels. Um, so that would still work for, for our division and making sure that people don't destroy it too much. And then they have wayside, or I'm sorry, um, outposts and roadside stations, which are much smaller. Those don't have the vacuum or the air compressor on them, but they still provide you a reminder in your face, in your boat. So these are becoming a popular option. I think the cheapest one there is the roadside, which I want to say is ten thousand. Uh, yeah, their tool station one is is about Just a two couple? grand. Yeah, a couple grand. Okay, and then they go up to about forty, depending on how many options you're looking for there. And then this is becoming a very popular option here in the state of Michigan. It's a simple sign that reminds people to stop aquatic hitchhikers and do what they can um, with tools that they can, you can either tether to the sign or just have it be free. Um, and so this picture is, uh, is a sign that's located on Black Lake up in the Northern Lower. And so what they've opted to do is they don't tether their tools. They've just decided, hey, if somebody steals them, they're cheap enough to replace we'll just replace them as they go missing. <clears throat> but those cost a couple hundred bucks, right? Very, very economical, but a nice reminder to folks about um, cleaning. So let's say, I, I don't know how many lakes are represented here, but let's say you have, you're have you on a lake and there's a DNR access site on it, and you're looking to partner with the DNR on getting one of these stations installed. There are a few considerations here that I'm going to point to. Um, unfortunately, the DNR does not have funding for um, to install these stations. Uh, and that's just the reality of the situation. With the number of access sites that we have and our, our working operating budget, it's not in the cards. Um, so we do rely on lake associations to be upfront with the cost and the maintenance if this is something that you're looking for. So my first couple of thoughts there, the two top bullets, uh, regard funding. So you have to think about what's your budget for a station? Uh, what what can your group contribute towards it? And then also what can your group contribute annually towards it? So for the operation and maintenance, these things do not last forever. Tools will go missing. They do get worn. Things need to be replaced. And so there are, there are annual operating costs with any of these stations. And then the last four bullets are more about site specific considerations for you. And so the first one is width of the travel lanes. So it is not a law in Michigan that if a boat cleaning station is present that you have to use it, right? It, we don't have that in statute. And so what we require with the DNR is that if you have a station there, you have to have a pass by lane. So that if somebody is stopped in using it, other people can get around. So at smaller access sites, that might be hard to do, um, but make sure that if you're thinking of an area um, that there is that potential for people to move around at. Utilities. So do you have electrical and water hookups there that might determine whether or not you would do a permanent station? Um, if you don't have those utilities there, that's going to add significant costs to the project if you need those. Uh, location. So Inbound versus outbound. When I talk to lake associations, a lot of people want these machines on the inbound lanes, right? Like they want 
people to use them before they drop their boat in the water. I make the argument, <laughs> devil's advocate here, it is a law in Michigan that you have to drain your water and clean your boat before leaving an access site. Kevin's gonna go over the boating laws that are new boating laws from 2019, and that is one of them. And so I always make the argument that if people are following the law, they should be cleaning their boat on their way out, which means when they visit a new lake, they're bringing a clean boat with them. And so in my ideal perfect world, every lake would have a cleaning station on the way out. And that would just solve all of our problems, right? But think about that. Like, where would you have space at a site? And where would you want to put it? And then the last consideration is site usage. So if your lake only has an average of 10 people, 10, 10 uh, visitor parking spaces used on any given Saturday, is that really worth putting in a permanent station? That's a lot of money for not a lot of people. Um, and at the end of the day, the outreach is what's important here. Um, studies have shown that just picking weeds off of your boat and draining the water is nearly as good um, at preventing invasive species spread and presence than using a high pressure wash. And so you also have to start to consider um, factors like that of what ultimately is at, is the end game for all of you. And I'm going to let Pat now talk because we do have um, some operating agreements also that you would sign with the DNR. So the first step would be to get in touch with your local, Greg. Good question. So could, would we be, Gravel Lake is not unfamiliar with the boat wash topic, but um, is there any requirement on inbound versus outbound in the, I guess the pass by lane? That is, you will not approve a boat wash at a DNR site unless we can have a pass by lane. Is that accurate? That would be accurate. Okay. And then the next question would be inbound versus outbound. You'd prefer outbound, but is that a requirement? No. Okay. No. That's my perfect world. Okay. All the right. World according to Christina. We have one, we have a question on, on Zoom. Yeah. So go ahead with your question. Hi, uh, you, you made the statement that uh, the first zebra mussels were introduced on private lakes. What is the source of that? fact that you tried to tell us? Oh, I could give you the papers for that. I can't remember the names of the lakes offhand, but they were um, Southern Central lakes, I think in Jackson County. What was the date of that? Uh, this would have been probably early 90s. Can, can you share that with us? Because uh, my, my lake is documented by Michigan lakes and streams to be the first lake with zebra mussels in the state of Michigan. And which lake is that? Eagle Lake in Cass County. I don't know. I'm not a then you made the statement that um, traffic is only 10 boats, then it's really not cost effective to, to do that. Uh, have you factored in the cost of the lake owners, the riparian owners, who then have to pay to deal with a AIS infestation. Yeah, and that comment was more about the cost of the cleaning. So if you only have a cost of cleaning, you're going to have to pay more. Hello. I can't hear you. I don't know if the answer is yes. Then that's your sole different obligation. We we can't hear that on Zoom. Oh, yeah. So we, we cannot hear we cannot hear the the conversation in Zoom. Paul, can you hear Christina? No, I I hear you, Craig, very well. I cannot hear what's happening in the room. <laughs> I don't want to get too close. I'm sorry. Gonna be scared. Now, now I heard a voice saying I didn't want to get too close. Okay. okay how's this? Right. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear a person saying, can you hear me now? Okay, that would be me, Christina. Um, so my comment about the consideration of um, only having a dozen. I'll have to wait for the recording. I, we can't hear you. Is 
anybody else having that problem on Zoom? Just out of curiosity. Yes, we all are. Yes. So everyone else is having trouble hearing as well. Yes. All right. I have I have one more. Got an external mic. Does that also require a bypass lane? Uh, it would technically, yes. You would still want another vehicle to get around. <laughs> Okay. I have a question. Can you carry the microphone with you? I don't know. Um, is that, let's see. Can you hear me now? Is that better? Folks on Zoom? Yes. Dave says it yes. is. Yep. All right, great. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thanks for letting me know. Okay, so Paul, the, the comment I was making about um, considerations for if a dozen people or a half dozen people, if, if you have a lowly use in comparison to other lakes or like the state um, access site, yes, it could still be worth your while to put in a permanent boat wash. But the comment that I was making was it would be a consideration for the lake association to consider the risk versus the cost of repair. So a permanent station is several hundred thousand dollars at this point. If you have very few visitors to your lake, do you want to invest that much money into a permanent station? If the answer is yes, then we can move forward with um, those conversations. It was just something that I threw out there for Lake Association members to consider. So working with the DNR, your first step will be to get to know your local staff. Um, if you don't know who administers your site, uh, call, call me, <laughs> call a customer service center and uh, they would be able to put you in touch with who the local administrator is. And then if the local staff give the heads up and the approval for what you're wanting to do, they can involve some of the Lansing admin staff. Sorry, go on, sorry. You would sign an agreement with the DNR that outlines responsibility. And so Pat has more information about what that agreement looks like. Thanks, Christina. So just to give you a little background, I'm a Plano District Supervisor, far from the top guy in the DNR. Uh, <laughs> I just administer the Plano District, which is part from Duck Lake State Park, Stephen State Park, down to Warren Dunes, across to uh, Fort Custer and Yankee Springs, kind of that Southwest Michigan area. Um, so looking at the sites, one of a couple of things, and Christina touched on a lot of things I was going to cover, so I do it. It makes my job a little bit easier here. Uh, so your site choice, if it's a site that we administer, we've got 138 voting access sites just in Plano, and she mentioned over 1,300 throughout the state of Michigan. So it has to be a state uh, administered voting access site for us to uh, consider this. Uh, so the county or the municipal or the local sites, uh, we wouldn't have any control over those and wouldn't issue any agreements for. Uh, a lot of our, our uh, voting access, access sites are managed out of the park and recreation area as well as the Elgin and Cass field offices. So among those, uh, some of the parks have, have up to 20 sites, the whole have just two sites, both of them, and the, the major maintenance are done by our two uh, field offices and construction crews. Uh, the field, uh, the Elgin field office uh, supervisor is Roland Hutchins. So he would be a primary contact uh, for this district, uh, for the bulk of the, the sites, as well as myself. Um, and I can provide an email address for anybody that's interested in that. Uh, again, Christine touched on the, the site size, the location that you're going to work with your local administrator and site supervisor on where that's going to fit onto the site best and get that passing lane and, and extra access uh, for the, the traffic going through the site. Um, keeping in mind the traffic pull of the site and how the boat come in, turn around, and then exit the site. Uh, she's covered the different uh, stations uh, that are available. Uh, some of the things to consider, the larger stations may need, the permanent ones may need a concrete base. 
The smaller tool racks would just be mounted poles that are placed in the ground. But again, still keeping in mind that, that uh, consideration of the travel. Um, funding, again, she mentioned lake associations determine the, the funding amount they want to spend. Uh, for the agreement, what is required for each uh, placement of a cleaning station on Park and Recreation Division property is a operating agreement. And this is a 12 page document and the bulk of it that you would be interested in is covered in page two and three. Um, the rest is a lot of the, the legal stuff and the insurance requirements. Uh, but the, on page two, uses of the premises, and I should back up that the operating agreement, the purpose of this is to allow the permittee to construct and operate as a boat wash station on PRA property. Uh, when you get to the use of premises on page two, uh, we're looking to construct and maintain the power boat wash, which would be put in by the Lake Association or our other partner. Uh, the committee is responsible to acquire and pay for any permit for inspection uh, that would include not limited to the eagle and groundwater discharge permits health department engineering construction and so on depending on the level of uh, the unit you install uh, you would post signage advising users of the site uh, that boats uh, may only be washed with water we don't want chemicals that are being used to wash this so it's primarily water or as she described in some of them uh, is just hand tools, air power, vacuums, and such. Uh, you would provide all volunteers and equipment and labor necessary for the operation and maintenance of this uh, facility or of the station. Uh, you would place and maintain trash receptacles, uh, mainly for when they remove the invasives and plants off from the boat. We want them put into that trash receptacle so they're not spread into the surrounding areas. Uh, and getting on to the page three, some of the couple of the prohibited activities, obviously we don't want any clearing done without the uh, consent of the Parks and Recreation Division and that site supervisor. Uh, so if, if we need to make room for that, that turning lane or clearing lane, then, then we need to work with you on that prior to that happening. Um, so those are just a couple of things on that. Uh, she showed the exam examples. We've got several in the district already. There's one at Yankee Springs Recreation Area that was put in. Uh, we work with some of the local Native American tribes. They're very active in placing, in placing these on the Duwajak River in uh, some of the access sites we have along there. Uh, so they've been a great partner in getting these installed. Uh, we've got them, a couple other spots in the district, and I can't recall exactly where with the 138 sites are kind of spread out. Uh, but again, for the, the operating agreement, Lori Green is the person to, to contact for the UP and Northern Michigan. And then Alyssa Buck is the person to contact for Lower Michigan, including uh, the area we're in here with Plain Mill District. Uh, and in my uh, name or my email address, uh, you can contact me and I can direct you to the correct person, is uh, wayland one at michigan.gov. And it is spelled W H A L E N P, the number one at michigan.gov. And I can direct you on then to whether it be Roland Hutchins at the Algon Field Office or if the site is administered one of, by one of our, our park and recreation areas. Two questions. So if we're already in contact with Roland, we could work directly with him. Is Absolutely. that accurate? And then the next question on the my favorite topic, the pass by lane. If the site is big enough, but there's not currently like a gravel road. It sounded like you'd work with us to make that potentially happen. We would have to look at within the confines of the site and see what the, the room the areas are some of our sites are are uh, if you will not a, a huge passing lane or an easement coming into the site uh, so if we've got room we can work with you on that yes okay thanks question on that on uh, in, in creating a passing lane in the site gravel uh, what happens if you need to give up a couple parking places that's a great question. That would be a, a good question for the site supervisor. I don't know of 138 sites. I don't know them all, all of them well enough. Um, it's probably an, also going to be a problem for the site. We've got some paid sites in the state in the district here at least uh, that don't have enough spaces for uh, the users we already have. So that would be something that we would have to look at the way that the benefits of having something on site versus loss of a site. How many of that may impact if you need seven or eight sites to get that passing lane in an area to get a boat, a trailer, a trailer, and a truck in there while they clean. You have to consider that, or if there's alternatives to widening that area, like you mentioned, and putting in another passing lane or an area to clean. Thank you. 
So is the priority parking spaces for guests or not necessarily? Not necessarily. Okay. Uh, question about, and, and this is maybe way ahead of myself here, but if we have a landowner who is willing to donate land for the creation of this boat wash station, is the desire generally for them to donate it to the DNR or do they donate it to the Lake Association? And if they donate it to the DNR, uh, you said all the legalese and all of a sudden my ears perked up because if I'm using a boat wash station and I use and I spray it with a high pressure wash and it knocks trim off my boat. It, you know, is it signed so that, you know, you use your own risk or I, I'm just way ahead of myself. Right. For, for donation of the property, the property we, we would consider those if it is a benefit to the lake and to the department. Uh, if it's directly adjacent to one of our access. That's the future, so you'd have to so that on a case-by-case case basis. In this case, it's moot point. It's sure. adjacent to the right. DNR site. So that's... Yep, and we, can, we can certainly work with that. Do you have a preference for what was like, or does it matter? Um, it's not site-specific. Yeah. It's hard to answer. It is yeah. difficult, yeah. yeah. Each you one, each... You would get your local, the local planner involved, right. too, to make yeah. sure that traffic and everything works. Yeah. Good question, though. Well, My name is Pat Whalen. W H A L E N, and I'm a Plainwell District Supervisor. We had a we had a question on Zoom, um, and hopefully Zoomers, I figured it out that the, the speaker it wasn't set up correctly. But the question on Zoom was um, this, this is someone from another part of the state. So most of the people here right now are in in your district, um, but people from other parts of the state are on Zoom, and it says. Um, They've talked with their local DNR Parks and Rec supervisor. And they've been responsive, so they've been talking with them. Um, so the question is, do all the different Parks and Rec supervisors know this process for developing the agreement with the Lake Association? The, it, like you said, the, the agreement does not fall to those unit supervisors. Okay. It falls to Lori Green and Alyssa Buck. Okay. And that's split up through the state of Michigan from northern Michigan and lower Michigan. So that means that that supervisor may not know about the agreement and that wouldn't be the person who would Correct, talk. yeah. They would okay. be more of the site on-site person. The agreement is always <clears throat> going to go through one of those two people. Where can we copy it? Um, you, I can give you an email address for Lori or Alyssa, depending on what part of the state you're in, uh, down here. Yeah, or, we're on Sherman Lake. We'll okay, so right. Alyssa Buck, uh, her email ad address is Buck. B U C K E, the number one, at Michigan.gov. And then Lori Green, again, she's uh, uh, UP, or excuse me, yeah, the UP in Northern Michigan, is Green, common spelling, G R E E N L, the number nine, at Michigan.gov. And again, those different areas of the state, state of Michigan split up for parks and recreation into eight different districts. So there's seven other people that are my counterpart that are stationed throughout the state of Michigan. So there's two, two districts in UP. Uh, there's Rose Lake, uh, which is just uh, to the east of us. Metro, Ross Common, Cadillac, Gaylord, uh, Eastern, Western UP. So there's eight throughout the state. Each one will have a different district supervisor. Buck E1 at <coughs> Buck E1 at Michigan.gov. Came in kind of late, but I and I hope I'm not asking a question that has already been asked. But I heard you mention four hundred thousand dollars. That must have been like a high, the highest that's ever been. The Cadillac. Yeah. You don't world. you don't have any electricity. You have no water access. Um, you want a high uh, pressure wash. You want hot water. It's an estimate. They can go quite expensive now. Yeah. That, that's really high. That, mm -hmm. that would scare anybody in the room away from anything. Because um, when we put one in, um, and we mo pretty much modeled it after the one at Higgins Lake, 
you know, with a nice island and two lanes and so forth. And uh, <coughs> we were able to do that with two really good high pressure washers and a shed and the, the works. And that was six years ago, and we did it for $63,000. So that's a really low end. I haven't heard many people getting it for 63. We were extremely lucky that we were able to tie into the sewer there. That was one lucky thing. We also had water from the that the township let us use, and we were able to pull an electric line over. Those were three really lucky things that most people wouldn't yeah. get. But we had a ton of excavation to do and curves to get the extra lane in that the township wanted. And it's the, the, the Condell Lake is the one that the township and you share the ownership of that. But it was 63000 and, and so rather than people walk out with 400000 Oh, I, there, I had given the estimate of fifty to 150 yeah, and then I'm like, more, what they could probably yeah, go up to yeah, several hundred. Yeah, that's the one I brought from that. Yeah. yeah. Just to give the other side of the coin, we put a boat wash in seven years ago, $20,000. But we had free labor, we got free water, and we're still working on the sewer. So it can be done relatively easily if you can get people involved around the lake. Comma, if you don't get people involved around the lake, it will fail. And that's kind of where we are now. We had high expectations, lots of excitement, but it's beginning to warm because people say, does it really do any good? And like you're saying, when you add the curbing, you add the, add the pressure washers, that just increases the cost to the Lake Association because we as, as a department don't have the funding to put towards these uh, for all the active sites that we have. So what you choose is, is what you can afford. I mentioned the Native American tribes uh, as one, but the majority of what we've been have been approached by so far are to lake associations and a couple of municipalities. Yeah. But again, the, the funding would come from that side. But and as far as our use agreement would only be on property owned by Parks and Recreation Division. <laughs> I am not able to stay around for the end of the meeting, so if I haven't answered your question, by all means, uh, use that email address and send me an email if you're happy to answer what I can or direct me in the right direction. Just one last question and statement. So what I'm hearing you say is if the Lake Association doesn't put up the money to build, it doesn't happen. Essentially, yeah. Sure. So I do have two quick case studies just to, to highlight some information here. So Higgins Lake, it's already been mentioned, they have a permanent boat wash at the South Park. Um, this was installed for $70,000 to, to add another cost estimate there, but that was 10 years ago, I want to say. So, so again, um, prices differ depending on what's currently there and how much equipment costs now uh, in 2022. So this uh, was funded by the Higgins Lake Foundation, which uh, there are two um, nonprofit associations on Higgins Lake. There's the Higgins Lake Foundation and the Higgins Lake Property Owners Association. So the foundation was the one that fronted the cost for this, um, and they do help with maintenance. And so the park has taken on some of the maintenance costs, but one of the issues that we have with um, PNR purchasing is that you can't buy supplies before you need them. There are purchasing restrictions in place. So we can't purchase wand replacements and just hold them in the shed until we need them. Um, and so one way that the local staff up there are working with the DNR is they will purchase some of that gear um, to begin with so that when something breaks, it can be replaced really quickly. Um, because with our purchasing restrictions in place, that can't always happen. So, Another case study would be the Dowagiac River, which um, Pat already mentioned. So this is the Pokagon tribe. Um, did a land exchange with the DNR, and they are in the process of restoring the river. And so they have been installing CD3 stations up and down the river. 
and they purchased a CD3 station for the local DNR access site. Um, that is an outpost, so it does not have the vacuum or the pressure wash or the um, air pressure hose. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, but, you know, it's there on site on the river for people to use. Um, and so we do try to work with whoever wants to work with us on locations. I don't mean to scare you all when I say this. Like, we're nice people. We will try to <laughs> work with you if we can. Uh, where is that? That's not too far from us. I wouldn't mind going to see it. Oh, yeah? Um, I am not sure where that would be. Let's find it. That's uh, Peavine Street. You're right. Yeah, right. at Logic. I did a landing bus tag. Oh, nice. Yeah. There you go. So Thank you, Alex. the river crosses Peavine? Yep, right there. I'm not familiar That's with this kayak. access site. Uh, it's, it's, kayak. A, it's a carry down site? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This probably doesn't have a. There, if if it's what I'm thinking of, they're still developing the site uh, further. So um, I would imagine they're, they're adding some parking, whether they pave it or not, but they're improving the launch itself too. Um, and that's an interesting one because because it's a carry down, right? So folks don't think about ca kayaks and canoes. That's another target audience that we're trying to reach because they don't think about, they think it's motors, right? If you have a motorboat, those are the ones that carry invasive. Um, but basically anything that touches water has the potential there. Um, those, that's our contact information. So if you didn't get Pat's information when he read it out loud, uh, there it is. That's his phone number. Sorry, Pat. <laughs> um, and um, that's my contact information, also my email and my phone number. We're happy to talk you through any or all of this. Um, if you're having trouble even finding who your local administrator is, reach out to me. Um, I'm always happy to work with Lake Association groups and figure out what, what works and how we can partner together and collaborate on this. We have one more Zoom question about uh, a comparison of the effectiveness of the CD3 station to a more elaborate system. Oh, that's a perfect setup for Kevin's talk. <coughs> so if they can wait 20 minutes, they will get an answer. Okay. Great. And I did share, you know, we did um, have MSC give us a study on the effectiveness. And we, we talked about it in the Riparian, and I just shared that. Merge, I shared I that article with you. Perfect. <laughs> Kevin and I, uh, we didn't want to cover the same information for two hours and just hit you with the same stuff. So we tried to we organize. <laughs> I have a question here. Perhaps you'll cover this, Kevin. Um, enforcement of the Nature's Law. Is that something you want to talk about? Uh, a little bit. Um, it's more of a DNR LED law enforcement division question, but, you know, kind of high level, 40,000 foot level. As a kid on the log and, and how they are um, enforcing it. But, yeah. Do you have what anything you in specific? Specific? Well, yeah. specific question is um, can anyone beyond the DNR officer enforce the new law? And the next question is how often is it being enforced? How often are we writing tickets for people carrying around invasive species? Um, so the, the first question is yes. Um, any law enforcement officer can that law will they are they aware of it that's a whole nother question okay um, we've done some outreach specific to uh, county sheriff's department and marine patrol and those sorts of things but in general um, you're probably not going to get you know local county sheriff enforcement even though they legally could okay. um, i mean if any my understanding is any law enforcement officer whether it's dnr law enforcement or county sheriff state police can enforce any law in michigan Um, how much is it happening? Happening? I, I'm only aware of a handful of citations being written. Last year was two, mm -hmm. um, but we had almost 10,000 interactions with voters. Okay. And so there were a couple hundred warnings that were given out um, and two citations. Okay. And so COs in general like to use their interactions as an educational experience if they can. Right, and not immediately hit people with a ticket. Um, it seems like a good build on the signage effectiveness. 
So yeah. maybe start positive and maybe go to negative. And I would love to know what the people who got the two citations, what they had done. <laughs> I wonder if they were sassy, because if so, I could see a CO just, uh, you know, making a decision that there was only one way to learn a lesson. A little different enforcement question. Uh, our lawn site, and I think most lawn sites have passports required signs. Are, is that being enforced anywhere? Who's, who's That's a pat question. Yeah, more of the educational side of it on, on when they're required. We, we put those into all of our sites in the last few years. And to cover a couple of things, there's, there's different divisions of the DNR and what we're talking about when they are issuing those citations. There's more of the law enforcement division, the conservation officers. We do have commission officers within Parks and Recreation Division, but they have only specific um, authority on those voting access sites, which is less than that, what they may have in a state park or recreation area. They have limited authority at the voting access sites, and I'm not sure if... They cannot Yeah, I don't believe it is, right. So, yes. so can local officers write tickets? Conservation Not like just conservation officers. So you got to have somebody there on the right day and all that. Right. Otherwise, nobody gets a ticket. Right, and if you look at our 138 <laughs> access sites, that's that maintained primarily by about six different guys for the, the major maintenance. So they're, they're quite spread out. Yeah, and so we do have specific grant funding. Maybe, Kevin, you'll go into this more, the GLRI funding that goes straight towards conservation officer hours so that we can guarantee that uh, statewide we will get a certain number of hours focused on our boating access sites. Um, and so that's where a lot of the work do, uh, does come from. And then local PRD districts can also pay for CO hours um, this happens at Higgins Lake. They pay an additional amount towards um, law enforcement division to increase patrols around their area in West Common County and Crawford. For DNR, not local law enforcement. For DNR, for COs, yes. I did not know that. Mm -hmm. But that is a very unique situation, right? Um, I, I don't, I, I. We, we have COs in, in the parks. Statewide, in, in certain areas, an example would be Grand Haven State Park, where we uh, pay a certain amount of uh, money to the law enforcement division to have them come out and help with the enforcement on, on busy weekends on a Coast Guard Festival or a July 4th. We've got that at, at several other parks in the district as well, and they're statewide. Like she mentioned, Higgins Lake, and, and there's others that come in. Ludington State Park comes to mind um, only if they have specific events or a, a need to have additional enforcement staff there. So I'm going to ask a question because you were saying that these uh, gadgets should be placed in the outgoing lane. <laughs> yes. Not the incoming lane. Yes. Okay, now I can see that would be a valid point if every lake, if the DNR or people put it on every single lake, mm -hmm. so it's evenly, it's out there for everybody to use. But if I, on, if my lake association invests in this gadget, $30,000, $40,000 worth, we get the fancy one. If it's in the outgoing lake, then I'm going to say, well, Heck, I'm just protecting the other lake, not protecting my own lake. So, and this is where the dilemma comes in, right? So I knew uh, there's always pushback when they say put it on the outbound lane because I understand where you're coming from. You are investing money. You want to protect your own my lake. lake. Yeah. And I 100% understand that. I look at things from a statewide scale where I would love to have people cleaning as they <coughs> pull their boat out of the water. I want them cleaning it. Um, and so, again, in Christina's perfect world, we would have um, tools or something available every at every lake um, on the outbound lane to make sure that things happen. But this is where you would have to consider what's important. You know, if your lake is already heavily infested with a lot of stuff, you might decide, hey, I want to protect the neighboring lakes that don't have what we have. And so we will put it on the outbound lane um, and be a good neighbor. If your lake does not have a lot of aquatic invasive plants in it, you may consider if there's room, put it on the inbound lane then and try to protect your lake that way. Um, it's a conversation to have with your group about what you consider important and where you want it. And the DNR would work with you on that. Because we have we have it on both. We have some lakes that choose outbound and we have some lakes that choose Something inbound. Better than nothing. Yeah. And it's even great, even if you have it on an inbound lane, you can encourage folks to pull around, do a circle, hit that on your way out, just do a circle. It's not that hard, right? And so there's potential there. Right. Sorry, you have a meeting. 
Yeah. And here it could be as simple as like a small little studio in here to get a speaker and have it on both sides and then on the where the TV is just mm -hmm. go around the whole wall. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Or if you feel strongly, you could have like a CD3 station on the inbound lane and a sign with tools on the outbound lane. So you still have something, right? Um, it's all up to all of you about about what you want. Mike. We were able to design ours so that it could be used in and out. And we found when we, the first year we <coughs> surveyed everybody as they came in, and we found, and, and Paul found the same thing at Upper Crooked Lake, that 95% of the boats that we inspected didn't need to be washed. Um, so we just let them go on through. And the 5% that did, we washed them. I don't think we were as careful about water in their bilge, though. Mm -hmm. At that time, just didn't, that, that wasn't, uh, yeah, it, it really wasn't. But today, it's my biggest worry about what is leaving our lake that has had zebra mussels since 1995. And most boaters arrive with the bilge plug in, and they leave with the bilge plug in. And when you when you remind them, you know, sometimes it's oh yeah, I forgot, and they pull it out, and sometimes they say, you know. I just, I'm not doing it. But that's a loss. <coughs> they have to pull the plug now. And leave it out. Mm -hmm. when Does anybody else know that in this room? A couple? You have to pull your plug. You know, oh, it's not the law. Yeah, no, the law. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> well, it, it, that would be, that would be a huge help if there was more publicity of Maybe that. signage on. Maybe sign it. We do have plug. that on our sign. <laughs> so All of this is the honor system, basically, and yeah. public education. Public education with some enforcement. And responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and they but really if they pressure. get used to it, yeah. they will. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about whether people really get better or get talent. Because I think at first, when we started boat washing, they were all pretty excited. We're a fishing lake, and we have a lot of people coming and going, and they get a little callous. And they kind of want to drive on through a little more quickly, and don't pull the plug, and don't turn around and look at the propeller, or look at the trailer hitch. Because they think somehow they're not doing it anymore. <coughs> We've been doing it for several years, Maybe some new techniques that you developed. Do you see people doing it as they're leaving? Yes. So they may like feel like they're coming in clean. Oh, do you want to switch? Um, while you're talking. And uh, another consideration um, about cleaning inbound boats is that you do want to be careful about runoff, right? And so if they are pulling weeds or taking their plug out right there, ramps go down. And so even with best intentions, some of that stuff might head towards the water anyway. So you really want to be careful and pay attention to where that stuff is going because even though you're putting effort in and cleaning boats and taking <coughs> plugs out, um, stuff could still be hitting the lake. <coughs> regard to the permits, probably half of the people who live on our lake actually have their permanent residence in Ohio or Indiana. Yeah. How do they get a permit? Any of your Michigan State Park or Recreation areas? Well, that sure isn't very convenient, Branch County. Branch County, there should be a state park within a half an hour. You can actually call and pay by credit card as well, and they can mail it to you. I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ready so the, the vehicle registered in the state of Michigan, you can get that at the Secretary of State office, um, or you can get it at your park. You're going to pay five dollars more at the park. Uh, they call it a convenience fee to like, purchase it there. We try to drive those purchases to the Secretary of State, but the out-of-state permit, either the daily or the annual, can be purchased uh, at the 
to make parts or hauling and making mail too. Thank you, everybody. I've got to get on the road. So have a great night. Thank Thanks you. Thank you. Much, Pat. Yeah. Appreciate it. Melissa, I gotta have you uh, stop your screen share. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. What are you seeing? Everything. Oh yeah, Christina, how'd you get around that? Uh, stop sharing. <coughs> and then get out of presentation mode. Okay. No. Is it And then put yourself back in presentation mode. Hold on one second. And then start sharing. <laughs> it's all about the order. Yeah. All right. Say that again. I'm out of it. All right. Uh, presentation mode now. Okay, go back to start the presentation. Yeah, and then go to Zoom and start sharing, and then you can click the screen, um, screen two, where it shows you what you want. All right. Did that do it? Yeah, that looks great. Thank you, Kevin. Does this advance it? Do you have, well, do you have the thing? Yeah, I do. Okay. You need to click on that screen sometimes if you're not clicked on this screen. There, there you we go. go. All right. Cool. All right. Got a little echo coming through something, but. There, let's try that. Hopefully, uh, those guys, this is still active, right? Our, our mic here? Yep, the okay. mic should be good. Yeah, but I don't have that on my screen, which is weird. Well, maybe. Yeah. You might have to get out of presentation mode. <laughs> if you hit space, or if you hit Alt Tab, you can keep your presentation up. I'll just go with it. It's fine. I think I had that on you did. Except well, now it's annoying. got this thing about. Oh, there you go. So it's fine. No, <laughs> you get that off there. Okay. Just say cancel. Yeah, but I don't, I don't have that on my screen. Is the issue? Hmm. Is it? Are you using it like dual monitors? Like it's a second monitor? Um, I couldn't tell you to be honest. Okay. All right, we'll figure it out. <coughs> That you can get that other thing out the of thing there on the too. top. You can get those. Oh. Yeah. Right there. And then you'll have it all done. You're perfect. All right. Now, Christina, go back to presentation mode. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can't it's not here yet. They've got it. But you, now you have to share, share your screen. Too many steps. Two. All right, now they see it. Perfect. All right, now, now this one goes back Clear to. Inside. There we go. Finally. <laughs> All right, good to go. Um, thanks, Christina, for, for kicking things off. Um, my name is Kevin Walters. I'm with Eagle in our Water Resources Division. Uh, like Christina, uh, I'm a biologist and I spend most of my time. Uh, on the prevention side of that invasion curve that Christina showed. So I do a lot of outreach stuff, um, which in the recreational boating pathway world, that, that is a lot, uh, a lot of boat washing. Um, Eagle owns a couple of mobile boat washers. Uh, some of you guys might be familiar with those through the MSU crews that operate those for us uh, in the summer. So that's the hat I'm wearing. I'm an I'm a Eagle biologist, and I mostly work on uh, outreach and 
a lot in the recreational boating pathway. Um, I don't do uh, permitting or enforcement for EGLE, but I am going to touch on uh, where EGLE's permitting process intersects with Fort Washington or may intersect with Fort Washington. So we'll get there in a minute. Um, there's some things here that you'll that'll look familiar to you because Christina hit on some of this stuff too, but I think it's okay to hear it again twice. And again, I'll, I'll be sharing a little bit different perspective just because I'm in a, in a different department. So um, that said, uh, where are we going today? So first, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the recreational pathway, the boating, um, boating pathway uh, that Christina set up nicely for us. Uh, we'll talk a little bit again about what's available to decontaminate watercraft, those three or four or five if we throw signs in the mix uh, of options that can help us decontaminate watercraft. And then we'll start talking about things uh, that might be best for your situation. What do you need to consider? And again, some things that Christina mentioned and some things that are new. And then lastly, uh, I'll land on what I think will be totally new, we haven't talked about yet, is some resources that can help, whether it's um, things we can give you, um, hard copies of things, signage, um, a few different funding sources that are not going to be direct solutions for you in, in your boat washing needs, but um, there may be um, some places where these funding sources might be able to help. So we'll get there at the end. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the background stuff because Christina did this really well, but just to remind folks, we have a lot of water in Michigan and we have a lot of boats. And uh, therein lies our issue uh, with the recreational boating pathway, right? Uh, boats are, are spreading things around, moving things around, and it's not just weeds. Um, the weeds are what's easy to show in pictures, but we're talking about things like zebra mussels and zebra mussel villagers and spiny water fleas and even fish diseases um, can be transported from water, water body to water body through recreational boating and angling pathway. Just kind of breezing through that stuff pretty quick. Um, so what do we do about that? Well, at least from the state perspective, we have a set of uh, legal requirements for boaters, and we have some recommendations for boaters, and it basically boils down to these four words, and really the first three words if you're, you're not doing any angling. So disposing is, is talking about bait and what you're doing with live bait. So we teach people to clean, drain, dry, and dispose of your bait. That's kind of the, the short answer. Um, you know, what we want people to learn, and we want all of this stuff to kind of be um, condensed down into those three or four words for boaters. Uh, what does it mean legally? This is what I'll refer to as our, our boater rack card. So it's like a um, three inch by nine inch card that we, we print. Um, probably about 25,000 of these every year. Um, and we distribute them at boating access sites through partners like our, our SISMAs, um, through folks who host landing blitzes for us. Um, we work with the uh, Boating Industry Association in Michigan. They, they pass out a ton of these for us. Um, if this is something you can use at your, your lake, if you can use some, some hard copies of outreach materials, I'll, I'll uh, have a contact for you here at the end of the presentation where we can send some of these to you and your lake if you want to have rack cards. But I put this up here because this is a good distillation of, again, the legal requirements for, for boaters and the recommended actions. And so let's talk about what the legal requirements are. Uh, first, uh, you are not allowed to launch a watercraft or a trailer unless they're free of aquatic organisms, including plants. So it doesn't matter if it's invasive or not. If there are aquatic organisms on your boat or trailer, you're not allowed uh, to transport the watercraft down the road. So that stuff needs to be removed when you're taking your boat out of water. That's a legal requirement, and that essentially is the clean step, taking things off that don't belong there. Uh, second is, is um, the drain part. And what it says here, you probably can't, uh, can't read it because it's a little blurry, but do not transport a watercraft without removing all drain plugs and draining all water from bilges, ballast tanks, and live wells. So, you, again, you're not supposed to transport your boat down the road without draining water by pulling drain plugs and running pumps. If there's not a drain plug for a ballast tank, for instance, uh, turn that pump on and leave that water at the access site. So those are the, the legal requirements, the cleaning step and the draining step. Drying is technically not a legal requirement, but it is uh, highly recommended. Uh, that's a recommended action uh, that we have in the state of Michigan. That if you want to go by uh, what the literature says, um, most of the literature is, is focused on zebra mussels and different life stages of zebra mussels, and it says um, five days between water bodies is what's 
the recommended drying time. Again, that's not always feasible for everybody, but, but that's the recommendation we use, and that's what the literature says. So clean and drain are legal requirements, um, and disposing of bait properly in the trash, not dumping it overboard um, back into the lake are the, are the three legal requirements that you could get a citation for. Um, the extra step, drying, is, is a recommended action. Um, again, nowhere on here does it say you have to use a boat wash to accomplish this. Um, this is all stuff you can do with simple tools, that you can do with your hands, for the most part, your hands and your eyes. Uh, we teach people to take a 360 degree walk around their boat and trailer after they pull it out of the water, remove what isn't supposed to be there, dirt, mud, debris, plants. Um, we teach them to take a towel or a scrub brush, um, dry the side of the boat, um, dry the insides of your live wells and your bilges after they've been drained. So you don't have to use a boat wash to do this, and the law um, does not require people to use um, a boat wash to be in compliance. And I think that's important because um, you know that's a consideration you guys need to make when you're thinking about spending money on a boat wash. Um, same information, this is just um, put on a boating access site sign. Christina showed some of these out in the wild. Um, it's the same information that's on the rack card. The, the red box is the legal requirements. Underneath is the law there. Those are, those are what the law requires, what you could be cited for if you don't do. Um, and again, the check marks at the top are kind of how we distill that down into simple terms for those. Um, as Christina mentioned, if, if you have a need for these or your sign's missing, uh, you don't have signs like this at, at your launch, uh, let one of us know we can get these. Uh, this is kind of where I'm going to switch to talking about outreach and, and getting the message out and kind of coupling boat washing with outreach. Um, super important. You, you, you can't just have a boat wash without outreach to go along with it. So, and this is where I'll start that conversation with you guys. And the overall goal of your outreach uh, for boat washing or teaching boaters how to clean, drain, dry even without a boat wash would be to make that become a social norm. It kind of touches on, uh, uh, Paul, what you were saying, you know, that people become callous to this. Um, what we want is the opposite. We want it to become a social norm. We want people to feel weird or awkward if they're not doing this stuff. Like, I, this is how I vote. This is just part of voting. I clean, drain, dry every time I take my vote out. So that's what I mean by your goal for your outreach should be to establish boat cleaning as a social norm. Um, what would you want on your signage or literature or outreach that you're doing with your boat washing? And it's, uh, I kind of distilled it down into these three bullet points. Uh, one, why the spread of AIS should be managed or why does it matter? Why should people care? Two, what's available at your site to help? Is it tools? Is it just a sign and you expect people to do things with their hands and their eyes? Or do you have uh, something more, a CD3 station, <coughs> uh, high pressure heated power wash? Uh, let people know what's there, and then lastly, obviously, they have to know how to use it effectively and efficiently and safely. Um, so, the goal of your outreach and, and some things you definitely want to include. Um, Christina talked about this too, kind of the continuum, the spread of options that are available to decontaminate boats and watercraft, and it starts with uh, signage. I should probably have the, the furthest left thing I should have on here is just the teal sign with no tools. And then kind of maybe that next step in the continuum is signage that provides some basic tools, a, a plug wrench, uh, a driver tool, uh, a scrub brush. And then one step up from that is the CD3 outpost stations that are essentially the same thing. Um, you know, these two things serve essentially the same purpose. Um, the CD3 station has a, a little solar panel on top and a light so it can be used at night. Um, but it also costs a lot more than, than the simple signs with just the tools. Um, if this is the end of the continuum that is right for your lake, um, I definitely have some resources that can help you uh, purchase and pay for these things. And we've got graphics files we can share and vendors that um, people have used around the state to get this stuff made. Uh, we, can, we can share all that with you. Um, Kind of moving along up there in the top of the middle, I have a mobile boat wash. That's one of Eagle's two units. 
So essentially a, a pressure washer on a trailer. A little bit more to it than that, but that's essentially what it is. Um, the next one down is, is a full-blown CD3 station that has um, both a vacuum system and then on this side, this coil hose here is a high-pressure uh, air hose. So no water, it's just air suction and flow. Yeah. Kevin, the, the big sign with the tools on it, the assumption is that someone's going over, grabbing the tools, dumping weeds or invasives in the garbage, and I guess the build is just forever. The build's water, are you saying? Or? Yeah, like it just drains somewhere on the site. Yep. Yep. Right. yep, exactly. So as you're, you're in your, if you're in the tie-down lane, for instance, some, some ramps have tie down lanes, maybe that's where you're pulling your, your plug out. Some people do it right at the ramp. Some people are pulling into a parking spot, but yes, before, <coughs> before transporting over the road is what the law says. Right. Uh, and then the last on the continuum there is kind of the, you know, a permanently installed high pressure heated power wash, uh, essentially. And so, um, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on each of these and give you some updated cost figures and some other considerations to think about with each of these. Um, but before I get there, I want to tell you where that information comes from. And this is what Melissa started talking about. So uh, my department, myself, and uh, Michigan State University, Dr. Joe Lattimore, and then she had a student a couple years ago, Maria Blights, uh, we got together and, and did a small study with the goal that you see on the top. We were hoping to compare all of those systems across three different areas. Um, effectiveness for AIS decontamination, cost effectiveness, and then outreach effectiveness. So we're hoping to compare all those things I showed on the continuum uh, in each of these three areas and kind of figure out where they all fit. Um, we started the study in, in 2020 and there was a field portion to it. The field portion got canceled because of COVID. So what it ended up as is what you see in the middle is the method. Uh, ultimately, what we did was a, do a deep dive into peer-reviewed literature. Um, we looked at 62 different published studies. Um, we talked to 12 uh, boat wash managers, primarily from Michigan. I think we included uh, one or two from Wisconsin as well, if I remember right. Uh, and then lastly, we, we reviewed data that's been collected over the years. Um, one through the Eagle and MSU boat washers. We've been doing those for 10 years now. And then also uh, from the CD3 stations uh, at Higgins Lake. Um, Higgins Lake was able to share their uh, information that is collected through CD3s. If you're not familiar with CD3s, they are, um, if you have internet connectivity or cellular service, they're actually connected to the cloud and they share usage data automatically. So how many times was the rubber tool picked up? How many times was the vacuum powered on? Um, how long was the vacuum powered on? How many times was the trash receptacle uh, filled and then subsequently emptied? So all that information is kind of uh, automatically collected as part of the CD3 station. It's an option, so it, I don't think that comes as the base model. It's something you can add on if you want to collect data and have this stuff collected. Um, and so we took a look at that data from Higgins Lake. Um, and kind of the key outcomes uh, are what I have here at the bottom. Uh, this paper is actually not published yet. It's, it's still in, uh, in review uh, in, in a journal. But the key outcomes, uh, essentially, if I have to boil it down to two things, <coughs> one, there is no single best silver bullet boat washing system. Um, it's, it's not, uh, you know, there isn't a one size fits all thing here. You gotta figure out what works for you. And I think Christina and, and Pat talked about that too. Um, and then lastly, you know, your approach needs to be guided by local invasion risk, uh, your local goals. You know, again, this is where we get into cleaning boats on the way in or cleaning boats on the way out. What's important to you? Um, location logistics, touched on that a lot. Do we have room for one of these things or do we only have room for a sign? And then lastly, of course, budget is also a big factor. Um, and to really drive home these two points, didn't remember putting, in it, put, putting this in here twice, but uh, you know the most effective decontamination system is simply the one that is used correctly and consistently. Um, you know, so that said another way, the best system in the world is, is going to be pointless if voters aren't using it. And again, there's no requirement, no legal requirement for anybody to use these systems. So 
if you don't make it simple and um, it, you know the instructions on how to use it simple and you don't figure out a way to change or make that become a social norm to use it um, you're spending a lot of money that probably isn't uh, as effective as it could be so the stuff I'll talk about in the next four or five slides all comes from uh, that, that study with MSU. And so first, let's start with the, the signage with tools. Again, this is Black Lake here. Um, I think, I'm trying to remember where the top picture was from. Um, we have a small grant program that I'll talk about later through Michigan Clean Boats, Clean Waters. And I think we've done about 30 of these signs around the state over the last two years. And I can't remember where that top one is from. Um, obviously, these, these signs with tools are really simple. Just a sign, just some tools hung on the sign. They're about three to four hundred dollars to have them printed. Um, we have uh, graphics files that we can share with people that have, again, the same language that's on the normal teal state sign. And it just has this little section added here where you can hang tools. And then if you can read this, it talks about um, how to use those tools and what they're for. Um, there's no staffing required for these, obviously, just a sign. And uh, again, templates available. And I'll get back to, to how you can get one of these from Clean Boats, Clean Waters uh, at the end. Next is the mobile or heated pressure washer. I'm assuming folks in here, uh, it just may not be on your option list. We use these because, uh, you know, Eagle has two of these. We use these because this is primarily how we do a lot of boating outreach, is taking these things to different lakes throughout the state, taking them to boat shows, uh, community parades, um, fishing tournaments. So we want to be on the road with these things, and, and we're using them first and foremost to deliver outreach messaging, and then second, uh, for actually doing decontamination. Um, if you were looking to get one of these, they're about fifteen to twenty-five thousand dollars, depending on specs. And when I say specs, uh, mainly I'm talking about the size of the water tanks. Our units both have two water tanks. We have one that has two 100-gallon tanks, and then uh, the one in the picture here has two 200-gallon tanks. So smaller tanks want to require a single axle on the trailer, reduces the cost quite a bit. Um, there's a little bit more to it than a pressure washer. It does have a you know your garden variety Home Depot pressure washer, gasoline powered, mounted on the trailer, but there's also a diesel burner uh, on the top that heats the water. Um, ours heats to um, 60 degrees above ambient temperature. So if you've got 80 degree ambient water in the tank, it comes out of the nozzle at about 140 degrees. Um, and that's by design. The literature says 140 degree water, depending on contact time, is, is what's effective uh, for killing um, zebra mussels, essentially. You need about 10 seconds of contact time at 140 degrees of water to kill zebra mussels. Um, it's tough to do 10 seconds of contact time. So that's something to think about too when you're thinking about do we need heat or not? How hot is it going to be? How much contact time are we going to get? And then the downside to it, um, when we're running student crews, um, a lot of times I will not have them use the heat because of the liability of damaging somebody's paint, uh, hurting something on the engine. Um, in Wisconsin, they use these same units and, and they're actually spraying out bilges and interior parts of boats, and we don't do any of that here, strictly because of uh, liability reasons. Uh, what else do I have on here? Um, so the outreach here, we consider this active outreach. Yeah? Do you ever schedule something like picnics or demonstrations to a local fishing union or something like that? Absolutely, we do a ton of that. Uh, yeah, I'll show you. So the person that does that scheduling is uh, Kelsey Bachelman, and so she's the um, She's in charge of Michigan Clean Boats, Clean Waters. And so Kelsey does, does that scheduling. Um, and I'll show you their website in a minute. Um, it's on one of my later slides here. Um, active outreach, because this is person-to-person -person interactions that we're doing here. When we, we have two or three person crews, one person's doing the actual washing, the other person is talking and engaging with the boater the whole time. Um, which is not cheap, right? We, we're paying, even though they're students, uh, you know, we're paying them eight hours a day. Uh, five days a week with a truck, with gasoline, driving all over the state. So it's, this is not necessarily a cheap option. Um, there's some ongoing costs. And I've got that there in the bottom and there's other considerations. Um, 
we collect all the water we spray from these. That's what you can see here is a, a vinyl mat that we put down. It has foam germs around it, and it collects all the wastewater that comes off the boat. Uh, we then take that to uh, a wastewater treatment plant and dispose of it there. Um, because some of the runoff, a couple studies have shown one that we did, um, one that Eagle did, and another that was done uh, through Wisconsin through some boat washing that happened in the UP, uh, shows that some of the stuff coming off these boats that have been pressure washed uh, with these things is above the state legal discharge limits for wastewater. So it can't go back into the lake and in some cases can't even go into the ground. So a couple of options for it, um, which I'll hit on when I get to the permitting piece. But uh, the way we handle that is we collect the water with this pad and a vacuum system and we haul it back with us. Yeah, Greg. So if your primary goal is just like change management, like changing people's behaviors and attitudes, and this is outreach, yep. um, is this the thing to almost fund and push and ask lake associations to back up? Because this is like people eat on the street talking and engaging as opposed to a passive sign or an article or something like that. I am a firm believer that the person-to-person -person interactions, even though they're pretty expensive to get as compared to a billboard or a sign, I feel like they're way more valuable. That's anecdotally. Uh, again, we have another study happening right now that's one, the other one I mentioned from MSU that's kind of looking at um, what's best at changing behaviors. Anecdotally, I think person-to-person -person interactions I asked because, I mean, I wasn't aware of this, but uh, MSU's mobile boat wash would legally have asked, can I pay for you to come? And the answer has been no, that's not how we yep. deploy those. Like, yep. how do we make something like that happen? If, well, if, we, if there was demand for more, um, it's, we've talked about potentially finding partners through our SISMAs that might want to have a mobile boat wash program. Um, there's a few conservation districts, Benzie Conservation District in uh, northwest Florida Peninsula has two boat washes and they model a program after what MSU and Eagle are doing. Uh, tip of the mitt, uh, Watershed Council in the northeastern Florida Peninsula is doing the same thing. They now have two washers that they're, mobile washers that they're using in their service area essentially for outreach. Sorry, yeah, no problem. So I, this may or may not be the right option for you at your lake. Um, you know, we, again, it, it works for us because our, our primary goal is outreach. Secondarily, we're trying to do decontamination. Uh, if you're at an individual lake, you, you might not need a mobile, mobile washer. It might not be the right fit for you. Yeah. Kevin, what, yeah, Mike. Uh, one time, you know, sometimes the students are out there with the boat wash, and if there's not much traffic during the week at the launch, you know, they don't see a whole lot of people some days. Um, and we noticed that, uh, and before they came out to our lake, we tried to figure a better way that they'd see lots of people. And so we invited them to come with the boat wash to our annual lake association meeting. And it's at the country club that's on the lake and we parked it right at the front door and everybody who came in and out to the association meeting got to watch how a boat wash was done. We probably in a couple hours a lot more people saw it that way than uh, if they had been in the middle of the week yep. down at the boat ramp. So they'll, and they've done it. They'll do it any place. Yep. We've had it at the Michigan Inland Lakes Convention. It's been a few years, but uh, we've had it there a couple of times, once at Boyne Mountain and once at um, Crystal Mountain. Crystal Mountain. Yeah. Yep. So we've gone to boat shows. We've been to Bass Pro Shops with it. Uh, you know, I'll, they'll have a big Saturday event where they're doing some whale, and we'll park it out front and um, kind of do some demos on some of the Bass Pro Shop boats that are there. Uh, we've done that. So it's a great outreach tool. Um, I don't know if it's a, the right fit for you guys in, in terms of decontamination, but what you're looking for at your individual lake. <coughs> so did you have your hand up or no? No. Okay. No, I'm okay. Oh. I was just going to mention um, the DNR is starting its own mobile boat wash program. If all goes well next year. Um, and so we will be focused on DNR access sites also. Um, so hopefully there are choices for you moving forward. If you want to have it, yeah. I'm, we, I'm, 
Mike Needham, and I'm from Plato Lake down in St. Joe County, and we've had the mobile boat wash station, I know, at least seven years in a row. Yep. We always schedule it on a mass tournament day. And therefore, we purportedly wash more boats in our lake than just about anybody. We have a lot of compliance. We have 25, 30 bass boats come through there, and they all see us. Now, our lake members don't see us that much because they have to come to the public one. And a lot of them go in and out of there once. They go in in the spring, come out in the fall. But we're generally in the middle of the summer and we do it on a bass tournament day. So I, I would encourage you if you have, and you can find out where all the tournaments are on your lake for bass tournaments. They're registered yep. on the web. So Yep, the DNR keeps a registration of bass tournaments. I think walleye too, maybe. I don't know. Any we know fishing bass. Tournament. Okay, any fishing tournament. Okay. Yeah. But fishing tournament's a great place to do this kind of outreach. Um, you get both the general public there to observe the fishermen and you're getting you know, all those anglers too who are moving from lake to lake on very frequent basis so uh, we've also watched them um, you know sheriff marine patrol boats with this too so uh, the next step in that continuum is uh, you know a permanent um, high pressure heated maybe heated maybe not washer um, and so again from that paper reviewing 62 or from that study with MSU doing, looking at 62 papers and talking to 12 managers, the cost we showed was uh, 50 to 175,000 for permanently installed. So that was the range, I would say. Um, and we have a table in that paper that showed that I think probably the average is somewhere around 100,000 maybe um, of the ones we looked at. Uh, annual operating costs again, uh, two to 35,000. I know that's a huge spread, but but. That's what's going on. Depend staffing is a huge thing. Is it staffed or unstaffed? Uh, most are unstaffed, but Mike, do you guys still staff yours or not full time, but we busy weekends or holidays or something? The, the weekends for sure. Yeah. But, but but finding people like everybody right now, they're just not out there. Yep. Kevin, I was gonna make a statement, kind of interesting statement. We did a little teeny study for two weekends. Just casual, no hard data. We found out if we put a high school kid out there with a vest and a clipboard, we get more done than any other thing <coughs> going on. Yeah. Take the clipboard away, take the vest away, and somehow he loses his status. <laughs> but he just comes up and he's friendly and he says, hey, how are things going? And we teach him a little bit of what, find out what their name is or whatever. And I'm amazed how many boaters start looking at their boat, start cleaning it up. I love that. That's that's yeah. awesome. Having somebody there that looks sort of official. It's so simple. And again, that's that's how would you establish norm. that social norm that I was talking about? That's a great idea. And when they that. remember their name, they come back, they see somebody with that clipboard, that vest. They don't have to do much. They can't write any tickets. They can't yeah. make them do anything. Just friendly talk. That's a cool idea, and, I, and that high schooler, I'm sure, gets you know, a volunteer experience that they can <coughs> put and in their hat. And even money sometimes. Yep. Yeah, there you go. There too. Um, a lot of this has already been talked about. The outreach here is passive, unless you have a staff boat washer. If it's not staff, the outreach is just what you have on signage. Um, again, I already made my case for I think active outreach is better, but passive can be okay too. We those billboards we ran that Christina talked about. Um, we used some federal funding, federal grant dollars to pay for those, and they were pretty cheap, um, relatively speaking, cheaper than a, a season of the mobile boat wash. And we got, um, you know, 800,000 impressions throughout the season. So if you get every car that drives by, it's counted as an impression. But to me, those are horrible impressions. I mean, <laughs> how many people are reading and taking that in and then are actually boaters? Um, probably a pretty low percentage of those 800,000 people. Whereas the mobile boat wash through MSU, we, we reach between five and 10,000 people every year, which is nowhere near 800,000, but it's person to person, active outreach, having a conversation. To me, to me, that feels more valuable. Again, I don't have any way to quantify that yet through a study, but um, that feels like a better use of, of time and money. Um, other considerations for these permanent ones, a lot of the stuff that, that Christina already covered. 
Um, and again, I'll talk about wastewater disposal when I get to the permitting piece here in a few, few minutes. Uh, and then lastly, the, the waterless um, systems. They're, they're CD3, called CD3s because that's the name of the company that produces them in Minnesota. Um, I'm, I'm starting to wonder how long it'll be before we see another competitor with CD3s that's also waterless. But again, if you guys haven't seen one of these before, I kind of pointed it out in the other slide, but uh, on the left-hand side, this is a high-pressure air hose, which you can blow things off to boat and trailer. Uh, the blue hose is a vacuum hose, so you can suck up debris, you can suck up water, um, and then it comes with some tools, some uh, you know, a grabber tool, a plug wrench, you put that little green thing in it, and then a, a rush solar panel on top, and then some lights, and then they have an antenna that does the data piece that I was talking about. Um, the initial cost, other than just the tool piece, that uh, what was that one, the outpost? Um, these start at $15,000. Um, a fully spec mobile with solar panels is $36,000. Um, annual offer, and these are right from CD3's own website, so that's where, where this information came from. The annual operating costs are about $1,200, so that's what CD3 says. Uh, 15, so 1200 to $1,500, that includes your vacuum pump outs. Um, tools or replacing tools and then software is again that data piece if you want to pay for that. Um, again, passive outreach, other considerations, um, you know, where are we putting these things? Pat mentioned, um, you know, the need for, for some sort of a pad. Um, talked about electrical versus solar. One thing I'll point out about CD3s, um, you know, I don't have any skin in the game with the company and I'm not going to talk bad about the company. I know the guys who run it, they, they talk to Christina and I quite frequently. Um, but one thing I'll say is um, one of the reasons I wanted to do that study with MSU and I'm disappointed we didn't get to do the field pieces. In my mind, I'm still wondering how effective is vacuumed air and high pressure air on things that aren't plants. So I'm not sure that, that these are all that effective for zebra mussels. Um, probably not zebra, adult zebra mussels that are attached to the hull. Those aren't going to vacuum off or high pressure air get blown off. Um, the belligers, which is the larval stage of zebra mussels that can be in bilge water and live well tanks just floating in the water, um, those would get vacuumed out. But to me, this is probably really good for plants. I'm not so sure it's um, as effective for things that aren't plants. I don't know that. Again, anecdotal. Um, I know the CD3 guys will, will would tell you something about that too. Um, but that's always been a question for me with these. All right, permitting. Um, first, I'm going to talk mostly about mobile because that's where there's a very clear, defined answer in terms of whether you need a permit or not. Then I'll talk about the permanent stations, and that's more of a case-by-case -case scenario. So mobile uh, boat washers, like the two the Eagle has, that's, that's what um, this slide is referring to. And I know that may not be relevant to what you guys are doing, but it will kind of give you a feel for some of the things Eagle is thinking about. Uh, when we're thinking about permits for boat washers. So there's a couple of options that don't require a permit for mobile boat washers. <coughs> um, one is if you discharge to the ground at an upland site 200 feet from the surface of the water, and you're not doing that for more than two consecutive days. Um, so you have to, you know, that comes with a couple of caveats. You have to assure no overland uh, runoff back to the lake or river. Um, you're not using any detergents. It's just water or heated water. Um, and you're not creating any ponding issues or, or other issues to the property. Um, in that case, you could do option one. Uh, option two is containment. That's, that's what I talked about, the way Eagle operates our own. So we don't have a permit for our two mobile boat washers. We use our containment mat, we collect the water, and we dispose of it um, at a wastewater treatment plant. Anything other than those two options, you're probably going to need a permit um, to get rid of the water. And in that case, um, what you end up doing is, is contacting your local Eagle District Office, which I'll show you how to get a hold of those folks in a minute, because that'll be relevant for permanent washers as well. And then the other permit uh, I put on here uh, is a DNR use permit. It's often, almost always required. Um, Christina can probably talk to that more than I can, or certainly Pat. But if you're going to do any sort of boat washing um, that hasn't already been pre-approved through a permanent installation, um, you're going to need to talk to whoever that site manager is, and if it's the 
and are they probably going to require a, a, a use permit and I think those are free. Those are free. So don't be scared by that. Yep. But it, it, it <laughs> just documents it's just a, it's that just you're there, form. why you're there, that you're not blocking access to the ramp, those sorts of things. So the MSU crews get those for all the sites they go to. They contact the, the DNR site manager and get a use permit in place. Is there something else you're going to add to that? No. Okay. So again, this is just mobile foot washers, but uh, I wanted to just give you a little bit of feel for, for how Eagle looks at wastewater from boat washing operations. Um, where can you find this information? Uh, we have a actually a boat washing wastewater guidance document um, that myself and a, another guy who's retired now developed a few years ago. And you can find that on our website at michigan.gov slash invasive. Um, if you just read at our website, I have to read with you guys now. You have to click the Take Action tab. So right on our homepage, there's a Take Action tab. Uh, and then you scroll to the bottom of that, and there's a section that says, do I need a permit or need a permit? That's where you'd find that. Um, specific questions, or if you're, you're wondering, we want to do something other than option one or option two. Uh, Matt Mulford is, uh, is a guy in our uh, surface water permitting section. And Matt handles those, those types of permitting questions for mobile boat washing. And then any other question about wastewater can go right through your uh, local Eagle District office. Again, mobile. All right, let's talk about um, discharge for permanent installation. Um, these may require a permit depending on the situation. Um, again, I don't do the permitting myself, but um, talking to our permit staff and, and dealing with people who've been installing these, um, it's a case-by-case -case scenario, depending on what you want to do with the wastewater. And I listed a couple of things that are options. One is a, a drain field, kind of like you have at your home. There's a few places where they have a drain field set up. Um, that's probably going to require a permit. Um, you can have an in-ground tank that gets filled, and then you have to pump and haul that water occasionally throughout the season. Um, that probably will not require a permit, at least for the wastewater. It might for the construction of an in-ground tank wastewater probably not um, and then you know the best case scenario and, and Mike you said you had this is connection to a sewer system which if you're not going to need an Eagle discharge permit for that it, it makes it really sweet and easy I don't know of anywhere other than you guys that have connection to um, sanitary sewer system at the boat ramp so that's a pretty rare I almost fell off my chair when he said yeah you can put it through a sewer and I said how much that going to cost Nothing. That seems to be the right thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I couldn't believe it. Yep. So I'm going to give you some specific contact information in a minute, but my recommendation and, and kind of the company line here for wastewater from permanent installations is to start by contacting your local <coughs> Eagle District office because they'll want to come out and do a site visit and see where and what you're planning. And then the actual permits get written through our groundwater permits unit. Um, and I'll show you a contact for that in a minute. So those are the two contacts you would want if you're going to do an installation of a permanent boat wash. You'd want to contact your local Eagle District office, and you'd want to talk to our groundwater permits unit. I think my next slide went through those contacts. Not quite. So your local Eagle District office um, here, um, I know you guys can't read this, but this is right on the Eagle website, eagle.mi.eagle.gov. Uh, if you click contact on there, it, it pulls up this map and shows all our Eagle District offices. It has their phone number, a general email, um, and you can also walk in and talk to people as well. But the more important contact is the person that, uh, that is in the know for this is Christine Rendon, is the groundwater permits section supervisor. And uh, I've had a lot of conversations with Christine over the last two years because lots and uh, lots and lots people are getting more and more interested in permanent boat washes. So <laughs> those permits, when they get written, they go through Christine and her staff, and she's she's kind of seen all the different scenarios, and, and she's the one um, who, who works through that process with you guys. So Christine Rennan, um, in our groundwater permits section, is the person you want to talk to. Yeah? So Kevin, with the CD3 system that has its holding tank, I think that's a permanent system. No wastewater, though, with that. They're waterless. Well, See? but the vacuum sucks. 
Yeah, but so so that that stays in a in a tank that gets picked up by the, yeah. the ones I'm familiar with. Are they have like their local uh, garbage hauler comes and, and takes that. So that would likely not require any. No, nope, because you're not dumping that on site. So that garbage hauler then has their own process that they're following how they get rid of whatever they're picking up and collecting. Right. And, and then, CD3 does not require a a uh, eagle permit. So then I don't even talk to eagle. I go to Roland first. If I say I would I would talk to your local yeah I would talk to your local park person before talking to permitting and if okay. you and the parks person are not on the same page um, permitting is probably a moot point. <laughs> so that is I don't depending on how you look at it that is another advantage of CD3 is you don't have to deal with a, deal with an eagle permit. Um, to me they shouldn't be. Um, super it shouldn't be a super onerous or expensive process i know it can be i know some people have been very frustrated with wastewater permits but um, i know groundwater permitting staff is becoming more and more familiar with with these type of operations and what you folks are trying to do and so they uh, we're finally past the stage where this isn't new to them boat washing for ais decontamination and what do we do with wastewater that's created through that right at a boat ramp so I think now it, it shouldn't be as onerous of a process as it, as it was, but that is another advantage of CD3 is you don't have to, you, know, you do not have to get a, a wastewater discharge permit. I think I just have a couple more slides. Um, yeah, so switching gears a little bit from the permitting side of things over to resources for you guys. And so these are the two funding sources um, I'm gonna mention. I'll say right up front that neither one is a is a is going to purchase uh, is going to cover the cost of installing a boat wash for you guys, and I'll tell tell you why in a minute. Uh, the one on the left is uh, we have a mini grants program through Michigan Clean Boats Clean Waters. Um, Eagle funnels over some money to Michigan Clean Boats Clean Waters, which is administered through Michigan State University Extension and run by Kelsey Bachelman. Um, their website is mibbw.com, michigancleanboatscleanwaters.com. We have a mini grants uh, program through there that is one to three thousand dollar grants, a uh, one thousand to three thousand max per project, and it can fund things like those uh, signs for tools. It can fund tools. It can fund staff. Um, I know three thousand dollars doesn't go real far, but um, it, it can go towards staff time who is doing. Um, AIS prevention outreach through the boating pathway. Um, they can fund outreach materials like rack cards, towels, can koozies, floating keychains, uh, those sorts of things. Um, so if you if you have some some of those needs, if you want to go beyond the basic teal sign that we can Christina and I can provide for you for free, if you want one of the larger signs, you want tools, um, and you don't have funds through your lake association to do that, or you just want um, Clean Boats Clean Waters to do that. We do have a grant program for it. It's competitive, um, so there's there's uh, more people apply than we have funds for. It's about $30,000 a year total, so it's not a ton of money. Um, I think last year we funded 14 projects total around the state. The year before, I think it was 12. So um, that, uh, that uh, application period is open right now through December 15th when it closes. So if you got on the Michigan Clean Boats Clean Waters website, um, you'll see a grants tab. If you click that, you'll be able to get the, the application for that. And it kind of walks you through the process um, of how you apply. It's a really simple, it's a one page application, really simple. Um, the requirements are that you're doing some sort of outreach for the boating pathway, essentially. Um, but again, a cap of $3,000. And it does not fund the purchase of, or even partial purchase of a uh, boat wash. But it could pay for staff time, could, could pay for signage, could pay for tools. Um, the next one I'll mention is the Michigan Invasive Species Grant Program. And so this is a much larger grant program that is um, money that comes into the DNR through state general fund and is administered through DNR with um, help from Eagle and Department of Ag, and it goes for both aquatic invasive species and terrestrial invasive species. Um, mobile boat washes are an eligible expense for MISGT projects up to $20,000 uh, each. 
So we have the two that I mentioned in Benzie County that Benzie Conservation District owns. Those are funded through NISDC. Um, and they were about 18,000 each. And they also, uh, in their proposal, put in some staff time. I think they've uh, been funded twice through there for slightly different projects, but they've had two separate two-year projects um, specific to boat washing. Um, you cannot, uh, a permanent installation of a boat wash is not eligible through this program, but mobile boat washers are. Um, I put this one up here um, mainly because this might be where boat washing or outreach activities at your lake are maybe a piece of a larger project or maybe something done in partnership through uh, your local SISMA or maybe your local conservation district or sometimes those are almost one and the same. So maybe doing some increased boater outreach to include some part of boat washing um, is a piece of a larger project. And the other thing I'll note here is um, the minimum request for MISGP is 25000 and the max is 400000 So your project has to be at least 25000 to apply for MISGP. You also need to be a um, um, legal nonprofit 401c3 to apply for MISGP or uh, work through your SISMA or through a university or through a tribe. Um, Craig, would you answer? Yeah, so basically this is only going to be I don't see how a lake association can effectively take advantage of this, but are you saying with Benzie County, the conservation district? Yep. So we can convince our conservation <coughs> district. Or so, they, so they're a local municipality who said, came to us with a proposal and they said, we want to set up a, an aquatic invasive species outreach program for Benzie County and we'll administer it. We, we need the funds. It's going to include person to person events at boat ramps. We're going to do some um, posters and some brochures at our local bait shops, and we, we want to purchase a mobile boat wash and hire a crew like MSU does and take it around the, the lakes in our area. So they'd have to staff it too. They, and their project includes staff time. Yep. Yeah, and that project is more than just Benzie. They have three or four counties that they cover with their boat wash program. Yeah, and they do. And so they, that would be another requirement to receive MISGP funding. You would want to make it regional mm -hmm. and not just a single location, a single lake. Yep. Because this is state general fund dollars, um, we're very careful of, uh, we're asked to be very careful that the money has a larger impact than one lake, one person's property, um, if it's a terrestrial invasive species project. So we, it has to be scalable or have some impacts on a, on a bigger, uh, bigger scale than just one lake or one property. And, and usually um, that program likes to see things, like Christina said, that's multiple counties, a, a larger region, or even statewide in some cases. Um, so again, neither of these are a perfect fit for, I think, what some of you guys might be thinking, but maybe there's some piece of what you want to do that could fit. <coughs> one, of these the one on the left seems mm -hmm. like it's a fit, depending on your Well, it is, operation. other than, I mean, it won't, it won't purchase your, your boat wash, but yes, it will, will pay for a little bit of staff time or a few outreach materials or some signage. And do we get money? Do we have to be a 401c3? Nope. You, you, a lake associations are eligible. In fact, we set that up because we had lots of lake associations coming to MISGP and saying, we don't need $25,000. We just need four grand to put in this sign and hire a couple of students for the summer. Why aren't we eligible? Or we're a lake association, but we're not um, registered as a 401c3. So we're not eligible for MISGP. So how can we apply? So that's sort of how Clean Boats Clean Waters Money Grant Program started was to um, come up with a way to address that. And that program is on soft money. It's uh, I mentioned MISGP on the right is state general fund dollars. So that comes out of Michigan state budget. Um, Clean Boats Clean Waters um, Eagle gets a grant through um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Uh, annually for that. So it's soft money. I, you know, that could go away at some point. Um, we've applied again. I think we're good through we're good through next year's grants, 2023, and we've got eyes on another source for 2024 and 25. but um, that one's not a necessarily a permanent program. <clears throat> 10 or 15 grants a year. Yeah, it's not a lot of grants. I'm, I'm hoping um, by, so 2023, we have $30,000. I'm hoping 24 and 25, we're able to increase that, trying to get it to 50, but I, we haven't been approved for that yet. So. Um, just about done. 
So those are a couple funding sources or funding resources. Um, how about actual things that you guys can touch and hold and pass out? Um, the infographics that are, are these two things, and there's actually four of these being developed, again, by MSU and Clean Boats, Clean Waters, that are essentially specific to boat washing. Um, they're developing a boat cleaning um, infographic uh, of uh, comparing the three or four systems that we talked about, an infographic for that. They're doing one that's specific to costs. Um, those aren't out yet, but they will be soon, so these would be things that you could that would be digital that you could uh, print out or show at a lake association meeting that kind of summarizes some of this information kind of in a neat and easy to read format. Um, we have our Not My Species, Not MI, Not Michigan Species webinar series that's all about invasive species in Michigan. That's, again, uh, put on by DNR, Eagle, and MDARD. And we focused a few of these specifically on boat washing and the recreational boating pathway. And so if you hop on our website, um, so yeah, I think on the next slide has the website or maybe two slides. Um, you can go back and rewatch those webinars, and it has a lot of the information that Christina and I shared tonight, or some of it anyway. Um, there's a lot about clean, drain, dry. There's some stuff about the voting laws. So if you want a good good way to share that with other members of your lake association, and you can't remember what was said here, or you want them to be able to hear somebody talking, um, I know your Melissa's recording this here tonight too, but those are also available. Um, and we may, and I'm sure at some point next year, we'll probably do something else focused on the recreational boating pathway through the webinar series. And then lastly, some articles. Um, the study that I mentioned with MA, MSU um, that compares all of those systems uh, for decontamination effectiveness, cost effectiveness, and outreach effectiveness, again, has not um, been published yet, so it's still in the editorial process. Um, however, we did do kind of a summary of that information um, in an article from the summer 2021 riparian ticket list uh, issue 26 is what it's, it's summer 2021, You're I think it's issue 20. better than mine, but yeah, it was summer 2021. And I, I also have, have a PDF of that that I can share with you guys, so I'm going to show you my email in a minute if you want to see that or read that, I can share it to you via email, probably more so can mm -hmm. you. Greg? Did you mention if you're going to continue that, like the field study that you and Joe were If we can find funding for it, yeah. We ended up, um, because of, long story short, because of COVID not being able to do uh, the field work portion, uh, we, that whole project and the funding for that project through the Fish and Wildlife Service got changed. Uh, okay. um, we're hoping to be able to find funding to do the field piece because I still have lots of questions about you know, the, the uh, effectiveness of, of all those systems compared to one another. Um, and I can't say anything other than anecdotally, um, you know, what my own experience tells me, but I don't have any study that has At that least out. for this Lake Association, I think that would be very, very interesting. These are some of the things that we would talk about, like, <coughs> does this work, what works better, yep. like, what's the real yep. proof? Another question we ask a lot is, are we changing behavior? And again, I only have anecdotal answers to that question. Um, we're, we're hoping through this other MSU study that we have some more concrete peer-reviewed uh, literature that says this works, this doesn't, or this works better than that, those sorts of things. Um, so hopefully that's coming. And then uh, hard copies of materials. Again, Christina and I can get you the sign on the left. Clean Boats, Clean Waters can help you with the sign in the middle. And then if you're looking for those rack cards, I can get those to you. Um, we can mail, mail you out a couple hundred of those at a time. Um, and then we also have uh, other materials available sporadically throughout the year. In the middle, I just put a few examples here. We have a watch list card. It's a kind of a plasticky, um, waterproof material of species that the state wants to find early. Um, things that are on our watch list for, for early detection so that we can stay on the left side of that invasion curve that Christina showed. And then, uh, you know, we occasionally have towels, usually in the in late winter or early spring is when I have lots of these to share. Uh, towels, cane koozies, uh, keychains, inch post stickers for, for the uh, tongues of boat trailers. Um, we've, done, we've done flashlights, we've done plug wrenches, we've done brushes that are labeled as clean, drain, dry. Um, I have very little available right now because we just finished the boating season and distributed almost all of it, but 
Um, if, if you guys can use that through any outreach or activities you guys are doing at your lake association, get a hold of me over the winter and we'll get you on the list um, to share that with you guys uh, when it comes available in the spring. Um, I promise I'm getting to my contact information. Take home messages, so we're almost done. Again, said this one already, but best decontamination solution is the one that is used correctly and consistently, whether that's a sign, a boat wash, in-person outreach, um, and then at the bottom, don't forget outreach. I spend a ton of time there, and I'm a believer that outreach is just as important um, to this problem as having tools to reach the root of things. A couple acknowledgments. Eagle, uh, Sarah Lesage is our AIS coordinator in the state. She works with me in Eagle, and she helped immensely on a lot of the things um, that were in this presentation, specifically getting funding for a couple of these things. Um, so Sarah was a big help there. Uh, WRD is Water Resources Division. That's the division I work in within Eagle. Our permit staff um, are very helpful to me because I get permitting questions that I can't answer, but they can. Clean Boats, Clean Waters, that's Paige, uh, Felice, and Kelsey Bachelman at MSU Extension. They run that program. Uh, Dr. Joel Adamore and Maria uh, were her student who worked on that paper that's still in review. Christina, of course. Um, Christina and I talk a lot about the voting pathway and, and try to work together on a lot of things. And then a lot of our funding, and specifically our funding for that uh, comparison study that I talked about, came from our stream of experts. And then finally, yeah, Walters K3 at Michigan.gov. Um, if you have follow-up questions, happy to answer them now, or you can you can email me too, and we can uh, we can get things sent out to you too. I do. <laughs> I, it's funny. I'm trained as a biologist and went to school for biology, but now I do a lot of grant administration and a lot of shipping stuff. So <laughs> you probably should have worked for Amazon or something. But <laughs> on a smaller landing grid without the boat wash that you know that Kelly has are available. I think they are. I I I um I wouldn't discourage you from pursuing um, boat wash projects with, with equipment, but I also know and, and Christina mentioned this already that the literature says cleaning, draining, and drying, even without any tools, is almost as effective for AIS prevention as boat washing is. Almost, it's a couple percentage points different. Um, there's two different studies out that show that, and I think the um, AIS removal percentage in one of the studies was like 93% or something with boat washes, and it was like 89 or 90% just doing clean, rain, dry with your hands. So very close, uh, if people are doing it right and doing it consistently. You also mentioned local and state is there a method for that, or is there a protocol for that, or is there um, that? Yeah, that's a really good question, a really complicated question. Um, there's lots of tools you could use. One is looking at a database of what invasions or, or what lakes around you have. So one place to start for that would be the Midwest uh, Invasive Species Information Network, MISIN. It's an online database where um, my department, Christina's department, Put information from our own work in there and then the public can enter information in there as well so you can look at what what's going on at the lakes and water bodies around you or the counties around you and see what's a problem for your neighbors that might become a problem for you um, our watch list is is uh, you know something that we spend a fair amount of time on every year making sure that we're looking at the right species um, things our watch list is, is not things like Eurasian water milfoil and zebra mussels it's things that are either not in Michigan at all or they're here but they're very um, uh, very localized just in a couple of places so they're things that we we think have the potential to spread and cause big problems in Michigan but we think if we find them soon enough we can probably or maybe eradicate them which is not the case with like milfoil and so that's another approach would be to uh, think about that watch list. Um, there's some monitoring programs. There's a, a public monitoring program called the Exotic Aquatic Plant Watch that teaches lake associations and volunteers how to use a, a rake to toss and, and look at plant life in your lake to find out um, what's in your lake. And so that might help you detect things that you didn't know were in there. Um, 
lots of different, that's a really, really, uh, really complicated question to answer. I'm not sure I'm doing a good job, but you know, maybe you have something to add. Well, I'm thinking about always the kid with a clipboard. It's like if you can um, interview voters and see where they're coming from, that can also kind of inform some mm -hmm. risk level. Mm -hmm. And Kevin, you do that survey with MSU School Watch, so maybe you speak about that. Yeah, we do. So, so the MSU crews have tablets that they use in the field, and they do a quick uh, five or six question um, survey with the voters that they're talking to. And, and part of the questions in there are aimed at helping us get a handle on risk. And some of that is like, where did you vote last? And how long ago was that? And can we establish any patterns based on that? Like your lake is always getting traffic from some other lake or some other state. Like if you're always getting traffic from somewhere in Ohio, maybe you better start thinking about what is, what's the problem in Ohio and you better be on the lookout for that. Or do the steps that we're using to uh, decontaminate boats, does that match up with what Ohio is doing? Um, you know, where these boats are coming from or where these people live. So things like that. My comment is if you can get a voter to talk two to three sentences to you, I'm from here, I'm here to catch bass or whatever, and no, I've never fished here before, I fished here a thousand times. If you can get him to talk to you, anybody, this uh, 18 year old kid, he almost inevitably will clean his boat. You didn't have to say anything. Yeah. The social norm. Yeah. Can't say enough about it. Yeah. So it, one of the things we found in that literature review is that when people see other people doing stuff, they feel like they have to do it. And when they see stenciling on the on the pavement, it makes them stop and think, "Geez, I guess we're supposed to do this here." You know. So if, yeah. Again, whatever you can do to make it feel like this is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is this is what everybody who lives at this lake does. They're all watching me. I better do it. <laughs> it's not a rule of thumb that says you go out 70 miles. But no. No. Uh, yeah. No. The, yeah. The quick answer is no. There's not like a specific protocol for determining risk. All right. I want to give Alex a moment to introduce himself so that you know um, he's a very a good local resource for us. Um, so thank you so much for being yeah. here. Kevin, do you mind if I use your? Absolutely. What do you, what do you need? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I promise I don't have many slides. I know I'm the thing standing between you and dinner. I will keep it brief. Okay. I think this has all been very helpful. Yeah. Would be lucky if uh, my state computer lets you use your non-state thumb drive. Let's see. You might have better luck. I might be able to do it. If you want. I, we'll see here. There we go. Looks so like it's gonna work. Am I sharing on Zoom? I don't think so. Um, you're not right now. And now you are. Good work. Perfect. So, hello everyone. My name is Alex Florian. I'm the coordinator for the Southwest by Southwest Corner SISMA. We've had people mention SISMAs a couple times today, so I just wanted to make sure we take a minute to talk about what a SISMA is and how we can help you in this process and what our role is. So. Oh, yeah. There we go. So what is a SISMA? SISMAs are cooperative invasive species management areas. We work with people around our regions to manage invasive species, to educate people about invasive species. Basically anything to do with invasives, we're there, we're doing it. Um, we work with lake associations, municipalities, just about anyone to help with invasive species. Um, there are 22 different SISMAs in the state of Michigan. I know we've seen a lot of maps today. I'm going to put one more map up, all right? 
Take a look at your county, see where you're at. I run the southwest by southwest corner, that very southwest Van Buren, Berrien, and Cass counties. But every county in Michigan has a CISMA. If you go to that michiganinvasives.org, that's where you can find your CISMA and contact information for your CISMA coordinator. What is the one at St. Joe and? Yep, St. Joe down here at the bottom, that is uh, SMIST, Southern Michigan Invasive Species Team. Their office is in the St. Joe Conservation District. Um, but because there's 22 different CISMA, there are 22 different ways to do it. So I'm not going <laughs> so to talk a lot about what I do specifically, because that might not be what's, what your CISMA is doing. So please get in contact with your CISMA coordinator and see what services they offer, what they do, and how they can help you. My office happens to be right here in Pawpaw. I'm at the Van Buren Conservation District. Super local, easy to get in touch with. I'm not all the way in Lansing. I'm not, you know, wherever. And I only cover the three counties, which means I can give you a little bit more time and really help with these issues. I already talked about what invasive species are. Let's go right to how I can help. Um, one thing we can do is lake surveys. So Dan was asking a minute ago, like, how do we assess local invasion risk. How do we know what's our big concerns, what's going on around us? One of the things that I do as part of my job is go with lake associations, take a uh, paddle around their lake or get on a pontoon, go around their lake, and just get an idea of what invasives are in there. And then we'll do that across several different lakes. And we can get an idea, you know, maybe this down here, this is starry stonewort. It's an invasive here in Southwest Michigan where there's, it's only in a few lakes. So if we found this, I'd say, oh, that makes us, you know, a higher priority to get a boat wash on this lake because that can help it keep it from getting out into other lakes. Things like that are important. Um, we also can write letters of support. Uh, several of the grants, the two grants that Kevin talked about, may ask for or even require a letter of support. We can help, you know, frame your lake in the context of the broader area to make sure that your project is aligning with those broader goals and make it more competitive with the state. Um, also, we can help with coordinating and networking, like maybe maybe just your lake isn't a uh, high priority to get a boat wash. But if we can get you and you know the five lakes right around you, you get a mobile boat, boat wash and share it, that a, uh, affects a broader area, gives us a broader impact, and that will make that more competitive for those grants and programs, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's all I've got. There's my contact info. If you're here, my I have some brochures and business cards over on the table to answer any questions. Are you able to let us know that another lake near us, that fishermen come back and forth, the other invasive that we should be more on the lookout for, or is that confidentiality? So when I do surveys, anything that I find in your lake goes into MISSIN, that Midwest Invasive Species Information Network that Kevin was talking about, and all that data is public. It's not always easy to get to it, because you have to search it by individual species, but it's all public. So if I've seen something in a lake near you, I can definitely tell you that that's there. On those brochures I have, there is also more information about missing on the back. I know a property owner who has some fragmite growing on their property. Okay. Can you help with that? I can give them resources on how to best go about managing it. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, there's fragmites pretty much everywhere in Michigan, so I'm not going to come out and spray it myself. But I can <coughs> give them information and education on how to manage it. Yep. How do you coordinate with like the uh, Van Buren County uh, Conservation District? So I'm actually an employee of the Van Buren County Conservation District, and we have a grant from Michigan DNR for me to do this invasive species work. I also work closely with Cass and Barry and Conservation Districts. Yeah. Anything else? All right. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you. Thanks to Alex. Thanks to Christina. Thanks
thanks to Kevin. This has been really great. Thanks to Pat too, all the way back.